I'm kind of shocked that there are this many people here to hear me drone on about running. Because normally people want me to stop talking about running, so it's kind of a real treat. Uh, yes, yes, there's free sand chimichangas for everybody. Um, well, thanks for coming. It's great. It was, it was an, an amazing experience for me, and it's, it's really great to, to share it with people. Um, so I'm Jay Solman, and I was part of uh, Team Trailwinders that just completed the 2009 Sahara race in uh, Egypt. So the, the Sahara race is um, it's a six-day ultramarathon, so it's 250 kilometers, and it's self-supported. So they provided water and tents, uh, medical support, and that's about it. <laughs> Sympathy occasionally. But uh, most times, they really weren't very sympathetic, and it was just get going. <laughs> that was about it. So it, um, you pretty much had to carry a everything that you would need. And it was quite amazing um, looking at the different competitors on, on, on day one when we checked in. Um, you'd see some of the elite guys with these little tiny backpacks and thinking, how are they going to survive six days with like a child's backpack? <laughs> and then these other guys that had these huge, like, I'm climbing Everest packs. And there was a guy at check-in. Um, we had to go through medical and everything else. And, and he, he had a fish scale, and his job was to weigh the packs. And uh, so there was a few people in front of me, and one of the guys had a really huge pack. And, and he weighed it, and he kind of looked at the guy. And then he said, with a few expletives thrown in, are you sure you want to carry this much <coughs> weight with you? <laughs> you may want to think about that right now, because I think his pack was like 30 pounds or something. It was just huge. Um, so the Sahara race is, is part of what's called the, the, the Four Deserts series. So um, there are four races in the series. Sahara is one in Egypt, uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, Antarctica, and the Gobi March, uh, which is in the Gobi Desert in China. So the race is divided into the stages. And basically, we're running a, a marathon a day, um, except for day five, which was 86, so that's 50, 50 plus miles. Um, and then the final stage, stage six, was really a, a photo shoot at the pyramids, um, which we were not very happy with, but I'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so this was my teammates, um, Mark and Lara. Uh, we, we met, I guess, five years ago now um, in, uh, I think it was a, our first, or maybe six years ago, our first marathon clinic. And um, after the clinic ended, uh, we just decided, well, let's keep running together. And, over the years, did many marathons and then started saying, oh, well, what's next? And so marathons lead to what's longer than a marathon and what's longer than an ultra marathon. And so it just kept kind of, you know, creeping up slowly until we started to veer into absurd territory, as we did with this. Um, so it was, um, it, was, it was a great experience uh, training and doing the race with uh, my teammates. So oh, we started actually training for the race. It was, it's about nine months before a sort of specific training. So if there are any kind of running geeks uh, that are here, it was um, more or less typical kind of uh, ultra marathon training. So we were running about five days a week, um, averaging 60 miles a week. Um, as we got further into it, we would start doing a lot of back-to-back -back runs on a Saturday, Sunday. So we would do 20 miles on Saturday, 20 miles on Sunday. Um, normally with our, our packs. Our packs kind of became our best friends. We you know, were constantly training with the packs just to get used to the weight, to get used to the way they moved. And um, it was, uh, but by the end of the race, we were glad to just toss the pack into the bus and not look at it again. But uh, the, it, it, was, it was quite an amazing experience. The, the gnarly wipeout was, um, was me, actually. I was, we were running at uh, Lakeview Trail near Bunsen Lake. And, came over a crest, I was feeling really great, kind of a little too full of myself, and I hit a root and pew, face plant right into, the, uh, right into the gravel, have some scars, a lot of bears. The scary old man with a saw, we were, we were running. It was, no, it wasn't you. No, it was much, this guy was way scarier. This guy was like horror movie scary. We were, we were running up near Swan Falls in the summer, and uh, we came across this guy who was a, a, trail, a trail keeper, and so he would help you know, maintain the trails. And he sort of stopped us in the middle of the trail, and he had this big bow saw. And we were like, good grief. And so we went on this, this diatribe about how you know, runners were ruining the trails for people. And I was like, sorry, like my little running shoes? Like, I'm ruining the trails? You mean it's not the hikers with the 50-pound packs and the big poles? Like, so it was um, an interesting exchange. And we said, no, well, we, we respect the trail, and we love it. That's why we're here. And 
but uh, we were glad to get away from him and his saw. Uh, so uh, packing was uh, a, a bit obsessive, um, making sure that I had absolutely everything. Uh, this was my, my packing assistant who was, uh, was, who was really very helpful. We laid everything out on the floor and went through my checklist to make sure that I had everything. And it all had to fit into a pack just like that one, uh, 30 liters, that's, that's all I had. So 8.6 kilograms was my final weight and then probably another two kilograms in water at the start line. So what you need to survive, it's, um, it's, it was interesting when we uh, got to the hotel, um, the host hotel in Cairo, and there was the check-in period, there was, you know, a lot of just hanging around the hotel lobby, the hotel bar, and we started, you know, you start to see the runner types filtering in, and we were uh, hanging out at the bar one um, afternoon, and, and uh, the team from Australia, Team Trifica, just showed up at the bar, planted themselves there, and we got to chatting, and these guys could like wrestle crocodiles. They were just <laughs> amazing, like big, tough, ultra athletes, these guys. And they had, this would have been their fourth desert. So they did all the other races in the four desert series and this would their fourth one to complete the series. So as the, the newbies, we said, well, would you guys mind taking a look at our packs and letting us know, like, are we really off base? What's there, what's not? They said, sure, no problem. So a couple hours later, bang, bang, bang on, the, on, our, on our door, and these three guys just sort of march in, start tearing our bags apart and looking at everything. And for the most part, they said, nope, you're in really good shape, it's really great. They tossed a couple of things that they said, you know, useless, useless, and, but for the most part, we were pretty good. Um, the, the, the main part where you can kind of save weight, I mean, food, you know, we were already stripped down to about 2,000 calories a day, which when you're running a marathon every day, you're probably burning 3,000 calories just in that time. It was, I thought, not enough food in the first place. So I didn't want to, any of that to go. So what we did wind up getting rid of were things like clothing. We we're gonna stink like goats anyway, so it really didn't matter. It's not like, you know, I wanted to be fresh for the next day, so. Um, the, the hotel slippers, it was really funny because the hotel that we stayed at in Cairo was this, um, it was a very posh hotel. It was like, like the set of a James Bond movie, a lot of marble and, and uh, when, I, when we got to base camp on, on day one, I noticed that everybody had these really dainty, lovely hotel slippers <laughs> that everybody had stolen from the hotel <laughs> because they were perfect little disposable slippers that you could wear around base camp and then just chuck them at the end. So it was kind of funny seeing everybody in the same slippers. So before the, uh, the race, we got there a week before uh, the race started, partly to um, you know, acclimate, get our bodies used to you know, the, the new time zone and everything else. We, we did a little bit of sightseeing around. Um, and I think one thing that it, it's interesting, I'll just briefly touch on, before uh, we actually left for Egypt, uh, 10 days leading up to uh, our departure date, um, Matt White, who's a professor in kinesiology, um, did some heat acclimation with us. So we actually went into uh, his heat chamber and we were running on treadmills for an hour a day at 40 degrees. Um, it, was an, it was an amazing experience. The first couple of days was horrible. I mean, you got probes everywhere and things stuck to you and that part wasn't fun, but the first couple of days, it was like heart rate shoots up, you know, you're sweating buckets and it's like, okay, this, I don't know if I can do this for 10 days. And then it's like, oh wait, I have to go do it in the desert. So maybe I should do it for 10 days. So by the end of it, what was amazing is that physiologically, we had actually adapted to the heat. Our heart rate dropped considerably, um, blood plasma went up and it was really quite amazing that you know, through this period, Matt was able to, you know, actually get our bodies prepared. And I definitely felt that when we got there, um, it, the heat didn't bother me as much as I thought it would. Like when people say, well, so what was the temperature like? And it's like, well, it was 51. And it's like, <laughs> and they're like, what, 51? <laughs> and for, for me, I mean, I don't know if I just was dumb and really just tried to ignore it, but I, I definitely felt that it was um, a really worthy thing to go through, despite all the probes and wires. So pre-race check-in in Cairo. Um, basically, at this point, they, they went through our packs completely to make sure there's a lot of mandatory gear that we had to have, and, and first aid and safety equipment and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the medical team sort of goes through our medical sheet and double checks everything, and then you sort of sign your life away, like you're, you know, okay, anything happens to you, you know, good luck, and you just sign the waiver. And, and um, they, give, they gave us our passport, which was a, um, 
you can sort of see them on the table. It was, it was a little card, and when we would get to the end of each stage, they would sort of sign us in like a checkpoint, uh, like a passport with a, the, the time for the stage. And, and um, so this was, it was a kind of a, a really neat opportunity to meet a lot of the other runners. I mean, people from all over the world, which was really made it like a, a real international feel to the event. Um, and it was so well organized. I mean, that was the thing I, I was really impressed with really throughout the race was how they ran such a tight ship. Like I never felt unsafe or, you know, that like they said the checkpoint was going to be here and it's not. Like there were never any moments like that. So I was, I was really impressed with the organization. However, uh, on our way, uh, we, we, we left Cairo um, and it was about noon, I think, by the time we got out of there, uh, our, the bus broke down uh, about three hours outside of Cairo. And we spent four hours in, I'm not even, when I first, when we first got to this place, I thought it had sustained bomb damage. It was like, it, I didn't even realize it was actually a business that operated. Like really there were chunks of the wall out. It was like, not sort of like your nice truck stop, but this was the Egyptian version of the truck stop, which was, yeesh. Anyway, so we wound up hanging out there for four hours while they went, I don't know, somehow they got another bus from Cairo to come. And, um, but what was great about the experience is that um, everybody was in such a great mood. Like it wasn't, nobody was kind of annoyed that, oh, now we're stranded here for hours, what's going to happen? People just kind of hung around and you got to know some of the other competitors and, you know, it started to get dark and it's like, okay, we're probably not going to get to base camp till midnight now, so what do we do? So people started making their dinners and so they're trying to figure out a way to boil water at a truck stop with like bits of wood and plastic bottles and but it was it was actually a lot of fun so um, it was actually one of the, the more memorable experiences was being uh, broken down at this place so when we finally got to base camp uh, for stage one uh, it was well after midnight and the, the buses kind of just stopped in the middle of the desert and they it's like okay get out and walk over that way and so we walked about 10-15 minutes from the buses to base camp and I mean the stars are gorgeous and but everybody's dead tired and so it's like you try to find, the tents were all numbered, you got pre-assigned your, your tent, so we try to find tent five and, and just kind of passed out. And then the next morning you wake up and it's like, I'm in the desert, I'm in the Sahara Desert. And it was a really, I think everybody at camp that morning, it really hit us like, okay, we're here and it starts today. And uh, what was funny too, the, um, the, all the, the camps, uh, the, the Bedouin really helped kind of keep the camps going. They would set up the tents, they would pack everything up, move it to the next stage. And what would happen is that most people get up around six and then um, if you weren't getting yourself organized, the Bedouin guys were taking the tents down with people still in them. <laughs> so we learned really quickly that the, the race runs on the Bedouin schedule and not ours. So get up early and get out of your tent. So it was, it was it was pretty amazing waking up there. So stage one, uh, 38K, they eased us in to the race. Uh, it was 44 degrees. Um, this stage was, was pretty rocky for most of it, kind of like, you know, um, it almost felt like, uh, like salt flats. Um, it, was, it was actually a very good running surface, which was really unusual because most of it was terrible. Um, so for, this is typical of the race. Um, you would get in a typical stage, you'd have a checkpoint every 10 kilometers and that was where you would get your water um, top up. So you'd get one 1 1.5 liter bottle per checkpoint and that's it. That's your ration. So the trick was I, would, I had two bottles on my pack and I could carry a liter and a half. So I had to make sure that I'd finish that liter and a half by the time I got to the checkpoint. I'd always save a little bit, and then as soon as I could see the checkpoint, I'd like take down what's there. So I always, I mean, it always felt okay. I never, uh, there were some people that had some serious dehydration issues, but I, I, I felt pretty good. I mean, you just had to plan it out. I mean, it was about 10, I think 10 liters a day was what we got, and that was for cooking and, and everything. I remember somebody asked at, at the hotel check-in, um, can we use, do we get water for bathing? And, the guy, and one of the guys was like, yeah, sure, but then you have less to drink. <laughs> so <laughs> it's your choice. Um, so st uh, stage one was, was kind of an amazing uh, scenery. This is entering the white desert. And these sort of mushroom formations, they're, they're just the, 
I'm not, I'm not even sure what the, the material is, but it, it's a very brittle um, rock and the formations were incredible. I, there's a shot later on at um, where the base camp was that was amazing. Um, the camels and the Bedouins at, at the back of the, the line of runners, so whoever was you know, bringing up the, the back of the pack, just behind them were the two Bedouin guys on camels. And at, in the morning, they would always say, look, if you fall behind the camels, you're risking getting disqualified because the camels, you have a certain amount of time to do each stage. And you know, if you fall behind these guys, you, you're, you're in trouble. So thankfully, I, I, I never saw them. I would see them at the camp in the morning, but you know, never, never during the race, thankfully. So this is the White Desert from uh, base camp. It was just uh, an amazing uh, landscape. Uh, it, you can actually see it, it, it looks a little bit like it was clouding over, and it was. Um, it was really quite strange because the, um, uh, the, the cloud, when we finished the stage, the clouds started to darken and we were like, no, it's not, it can't rain here. And sure enough, I was in the tent and I hear these, what sound like drops and I'm outside and I'm like, it's raining in the desert, like how can this be? But raining in the desert meant like about 15 seconds and then <laughs> the sun came out and it was, it was gone. So it was not like the big rainstorm. Um, this was how they marked the course. They had these tiny little pink flags that they would put out about every 100 meters. And um, it was really easy to lose them <laughs> just because the terrain would be undulating or there'd be little rocks that would get in the way or they'd blow over. And early in the stage, it was, it's fine. You'd kind of pay attention. But then, you know, your mind would kind of drift off and, you know, you wouldn't pay attention. And then you'd be like, where are the flags? And you try to find the flags and, you know, eventually you'd sort of find them and get back on track. But um, there was a, a Scottish guy in the tent next to us. And at one point he had, there were some people ahead of him and they were really fanning out. And apparently he like yelled at them using many expletives to get them to come back to, he says, really simple, follow the pink flags. So it wasn't that simple, but we tried our best. Uh, there were many times where I asked this question. Um, and uh, it was still early on. Um, <laughs> the, the pack in the front, um, the, the raid light pack that I used are, um, they're packs from France that are designed for stage racing. So you, I would keep kind of all my stuff for the trail in my pack. So anything I was gonna eat during the day, and it was sort of easy to get to. So all my hydration tablets, um, electrolytes, uh, potato chips, Potato chips, if, if, you, if, you're, if you don't know a lot about ultra running, uh, potato chips are the food of choice with many ultra runners, uh, which is one of the reasons I love ultra running is that I can, it's an excuse to eat chips. Um, because they're, they're really high in calories, they have a lot of salt, and they're very light. So I would have, you know, a few hundred grams, or not even, I would have 100 grams of chips, and they'd be like, you know, three, 400 calories. And I'd be like, this is great. So. You saw a lot of potato chips around the camp. Uh, so this is uh, the end of stage one and a, sort of a typical uh, base camp kind of setup. Camp life. Um, it was definitely dirty, smelly, and, and quite sandy. Uh, but there was also something really amazing about it. Uh, I, I really loved the end of the stage, A, because it was done, but also because I, I kind of look forward to the routine at camp. Um, it was very simple. You'd get in, uh, you'd check what state your feet were in. <laughs> There'd be some blister management and maybe a visit to the medical tent. Um, and then people would kind of, you know, get their dinner going and pass out. And that was kind of it every day. Um, but people were amazing. I mean, uh, it, was, it was an incredible little community that really developed over that six day period. And it was, uh, Camp was one of my favorites. Um, not very luxurious accommodations. We were pretty packed in there. Uh, in fact, one of my tent mates, uh, Daniel from New Zealand, uh, one morning, I remember getting up and I, I was one of the first to get up in the tent and I went outside the tent, I tripped over something and it was Daniel who decided to sleep outside of the tent. And so he had a sleeping bag right up front. And I was like, why, why, why are you sleeping out here? And he's like, apparently him and I were playing footsie all night, but we, <laughs> So he got sick of it and went outside. <laughs> uh, the, again, the, the Bedouin, they, they were just amazing at keeping things going. And they were just the, the nicest 
people. Like it, the, there was always these, um, these teenage boys who would uh, tend the fire and that's where you could get you know, hot water and uh, they were very, very, very sweet. So I, that was, uh, it was really great. Again, typical camp kind of picture. Um, people passed out looking for shade somewhere. Um, uh, in, in terms of food, this is it. I mean, that dehydrated food. Um, to save weight, I even took mine out of the packages, the, the, the bags that they come in. You just sort of add water and it rehydrates. Um, yeah, I, I took the food out and put it in Ziploc bags. And then instead of having a pot to rehydrate in, I took one of the 1.5 liter bottles, I cut it in half, I put the food in it, and then I'd pour hot water in it. It would sort of melt a little bit and probably add some toxins to my dinner, but I lived. And then I'd use the other half for a tea. And this was very typical of how most people would, would do their, their dinners. Um, I was very sick of chicken and rice by the end, because um, that's pretty much all I took, because it was uh, 800 calories per meal or something crazy. But. Again, very typical, uh, at the end of, a, end of stage, you'd, you'd always look for the shade. The tents got really stuffy. They were canvas, and um, during the day, they were not very nice, so we'd hang out uh, in the back. Uh, the cyber tent was also a really busy place. Um, the, the cyber tent was a really amazing uh, setup that the organizers had. They had laptops, and we couldn't sort of send emails in real time or receive anything in real time. But at the end of the stage, any emails that we got from family or friends were kind of thrown into a spreadsheet and you could kind of scroll through and find yours and read them. And then we could send kind of one email to family and friends. And it was an amazing part of the day where you'd kind of finish dinner and then go to the tent and read, you know, whatever and, and uh, some, uh, other uh, friends of mine who, who I've been training with for years, um, they put together little letters for our team for each day. So for each stage, we had a different letter. And the letter was you know, encouraging things, silly things, all kinds of stuff. But it was amazing to go in the tent. This, this guy, Pete, he was one of the, the Australians. Um, he's you know big, strong, tough guy. And you know he'd be reading his emails. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was it was hard not to get you know really emotional in the in there because it was that time where you'd be kind of processing it and thinking about the day and the, how hard it was, but also how how far you really were from everybody back home, and so it really brought a lot of emotions up being in the cyber tent. It was this is one of my tent mates, uh, Sang, who was. Uh, he was amazing. Uh, we, we sort of started up a bit of a uh, chat uh, relationship before the race. He was just asking pointers, whatever. And then he said, oh, can I you know, request to be in, in the same tent as you? I said, sure, no problem. So he was uh, amazing, very funny, really charming. And uh, so uh, again, one of, uh, just thrilled at the, the tent mates that we had. Uh, terrible picture of the rest of us. Unfortunately, the, the, the race bibs that we had were these made of plastic, but they were reflective. So if we got lost, they could you know, try to find us out there with the, with the lights. Uh, again, just typical. This, um, this was a father and son team from uh, New Zealand, uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel and, and John. And um, the, the woman is actually Daniel's fiance. And uh, they were the sweetest people, and Daniel especially. And you notice there's a, a coffee bottom Daniel packed and carried the bottom and surprised his fiance and every morning would be grinding <laughs> beans and making fresh coffee for her while the rest of us were drinking, you know, the putrid instant packets that were horrible. In sympathy, he did give me a cup one morning, which was really nice. Um, John was amazing. Uh, he was 66. Um, and a veteran of many, many stage races. Uh, he was uh, just a wonderful man. John <laughs> made, he, he, he made his own camp outfit. <laughs> and at one point we said, you know, you look like Moses. <laughs> and what you should do is you should, there were some dunes just behind the tent. And we were saying, you should go up to the dune and come down with the light behind you. <laughs> 
and, and be, say something to the camp like, there's five more commandments I forgot about. And, <laughs> and John, we almost got him to do it, but we loved seeing him walk around the camp with his flowing <laughs> attire that he made. He made his own pack too, which was amazing. He was a really neat guy. So stage two um, was the hottest uh, temperature that they'd ever recorded at the race, so 51 uh, degrees. I, it's hard to even explain, because people say, well, what's 51 like? It's like, it, at a certain point, you don't know between 35 and 50. I don't know, it's hot. It just, it was, we really noticed it around 11, 11 a.m. Um, and this stage was very, it was my favorite stage, but it was very disorienting because um, it was a sea of sand. So every direction you looked was like that, like, you know, just where I'm standing. That's all you'd see with sand. And so you had, you had no sense of how far things were. Like you'd see a checkpoint and you'd be like, great, we're near the checkpoint. And then 40 minutes later, we're not closer to the checkpoint. <laughs> and it would just, nothing would get closer. These, these dunes, they told us at the beginning of the stage that there was going to be dunes near the end of the stage. So we thought, great, we're, we're close to the dunes. And we just kept get closer and closer, and they just never got any closer. Um, and the dunes were huge. And that was the other thing. You don't really have a sense when you see pictures of sand dunes how enormous these things are. Like when we were at the top of one of the dunes, um, I think the tallest one was something like 14 or 15 stories. Like it's just... It's huge, um, and they are a struggle to get up. Once you're at the top, it's not so bad, but getting up the dune is really tough. So some, some runners along sort of one of the ridges of, of the dune. Some people had uh, poles. Um, I, I didn't, but um, I, I definitely saw the value of them, um, especially when getting up the dunes just really helps you kind of power up. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't. So that gives you a sense of how steep they were. You, you, you would start running up the dune and you would just start sliding back. And so you would have to just give everything you had and you'd still be sliding back and eventually you'd take a few tries at it and you'd, you'd sort of get to the top, but it was, um, they were really tough. So um, this was a shot. They had, um, a, lot of the, a lot of these pictures are, um, they had race photographers that were there that, that took some of the pictures. So they got one of me, uh, heading up this dune and it's like, you know, I'm near, near, I know the end is near uh, for the stage and I'm going up the dune, you get to the top and then it's like, there's another one and you just, <laughs> you go down and then you'd have to go back up and back down and it was, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. So stage three, um, when we, when we left um, the second camp, uh, we, we had to leave behind the camp and went up on this, uh, this one really large dune and they're, they're quite narrow at the top, so we had to kind of run, really walk at this point, single file. Um, so it was kind of a neat shot um, to give you a sense of, you know, everybody walking along the spine of that dune. Um, stage three was also, you know, extremely hot, and that was where um, you started to notice people dropping off. Um, the first checkpoint we got to on stage three was like a mash unit. There was two or three runners passed out, you know, there's a doctor tending to one person, another guy just looking really delirious, people being helped along, like, it really started to reinforce how tough it was and how some people were really having a tough time. There was a guy that we came across during this stage, just before we got to this checkpoint, actually, and I think the guy without the shirt on, I think that's the guy, he was, he was kind of weaving back and forth and he was stumbling and so we we stopped near him and it's like you know you're all right and um, we'd been running with um, a, a woman sort of you know uh, named Venetia uh, Price from England uh, she had a similar pace to us and so she just sort of joined in with our group and she was a nurse um, and so he was starting to show some signs of really quite serious dehydration and so we gave him some water and some electrolytes and said we'd send a, a jeep back from the checkpoint, and, uh, but it was really tough. Um, the guy with the Turkish flag, he, he's um, from Ottawa, actually, Mehmet uh, Dennis, and he won the Gobi March last year. Unfortunately, he, did, he had a tough time this year at this race, and um, some medical <coughs> issues sidelined him. Uh, the guy in the middle was the guy who won. Uh, he's from uh, Italy, I think. And I think he was like 49, too. Like, 
quite an amazing athlete. That's me, one foot in front of the other. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, sometimes that's all you could kind of think about was just keep moving, just one foot in front. There's, you know, after a while, the scenery, you're, you know, there's the ooh-ah at the beginning, and, and then as the day would go on, it'd be like, okay, one foot, one foot, just keep going. Um, stage three, too, this was a, quite an amazing sight. They, they had told us that there was going to be an oasis, but, um, you know, you sort of have the image in your mind of like the cartoon, you know, oasis, and it actually was. It was quite bizarre to just all of a sudden see these palm trees and grass sort of sprout up. Um, uh, it was it was amazing, amazingly lush and, and green and date palms and... Uh, uh, we ran in, one of my, my tent mates was passed out under a palm tree. He just decided to take a nap. So uh, some people actually uh, jumped right into the, to the little um, pool that was there. And um, we thought about it for a minute, but then it's kind of like, you know what, let's just keep going. There's, there's, as appealing as it did seem at the time, but we just splashed some water and that was about it. So stage four um, at the start line was about 40, yeah, 40 degrees. And this was really, really, really soft, soft sand, um, which was just, it was, it was terrible. <laughs> it was horrible to run in. I mean, you just, you, you would tire yourself out so much that at a certain point in this stage, the, it seemed that the best way to handle it was more of a power walk than actually a run. Because you just, you weren't going anywhere fast, so to run it just made no sense. Um, it, was, it was a tough day. Um, we started to enter the Black Desert at this point, um, and there was one spot that we came to, and I remember we were running along, and it kind of looked like all these um, pottery fragments. And um, so I remember when we got to the next checkpoint, um, asking about that, and they said, yeah, it was actually, uh, a, there was a Roman... Um, a camp that was there and they had uh, pottery production and so those actually all those small pieces were were from when it was uh, a Roman settlement. Uh, Ron Hackett, uh, Ron Hackett was a blind runner from um, Ontario and uh, Jesse um, who's on this side and, and Tom the one helping Ron um, kind of guided Ron throughout the, the entire race. Uh, on stage five uh, Tom, Tom and I, you know, we got to know most of the other Canadians and we, we talked at one point and it turned out that Ron Hackett was a huge music fan, loved music. And so on stage five, Ron and I got a chance to run a stage together. And uh, Tom said, you know, just, uh, he'll put his arm on you and just, you know, that's it, just, you know, guide him. And I, so we run along and we start talking about music and we're really into it. And then all of a sudden, Ron trips. And I'm like, oh, crap. It's like, I forgot, I have to be our, my, his eyes too. <laughs> and... <laughs> Ron was, he was really sweet about it. Like, he didn't say anything. He just kept going. So it, it took me a few minutes to figure out, like, oh, yeah, I, I shouldn't let him trip and fall. That would be bad. <laughs> but he was amazing. Um, we had a, a great chat just about our love of music. And uh, he was an amazing, amazing guy. Um, it was uh, it's just a, a real inspiration. Like, I, it was I can't even put it into words. Um, when we got to the end of stage four, it got quite hilly um, and it, very, very, very soft uh, sand with sort of big rocks in it. So it was really difficult terrain. Um, and I think at this point, the accumulation of the, the, the beating on the body was starting to catch up and everybody was really starting to slow down a lot. Um, and the worst day was sort of yet to come. So um, we, we had to hang in there for that last one. But I, I do remember this stage, especially on these hills, there was some, some cursing uh, coming out of me. And this expression on my face kind of says it right there. I, wasn't, I was not very happy. My feet were really killing me that day. I don't know why. So stage five was, was the, the long day. Um, so we started, uh, I think, about six in the morning, which was great because it was much, much cooler. And much cooler means like 30. <laughs> so it was, it was, uh, it was, it, it actually didn't really get cold. That was one thing that a lot of people asked me. They said, well, does it get really cold? Because I'd, I'd done a uh, marathon in, uh, in Death Valley and uh, it got quite cold at night. 
And uh, I was surprised um, in the Sahara that there were a lot of times where I didn't even get in my sleeping bag. I just sort of had it on top because it was never super cold, like low 20s at, at most. So the long day. Um, you know, at, at checkpoint one, it's all smiles and happy and everything's good. And, and it, um, yeah, we, we weren't as perky later on, that's for sure. So that's the three of us. Um, about halfway through the stage, we, we came, um, we were running along this plateau and it was these tiny little black rocks and that was all on this plateau and it was very difficult footing because you, you couldn't kind of run, it's like running on pebbles that somebody had placed very neatly and perfect distance apart from each other so you couldn't, you couldn't find any good footing. Um, so it was very difficult and then all of a sudden um, we, we got to, you know, this cliff and looked down and there's this oasis, really quite a large one too. And so there was this village and when we, we started our descent down this really steep trail and when we got to the bottom there were some kids that were there and, you know, they were asking for candy or money or whatever we had and we, we had nothing. Like, <laughs> and I just, you know, just ran across the desert. I don't, I don't have anything with me right now. Um, but, you know, we, I, I think I gave one of them, I had a gel or something, ooh, yum, but that's, that's what we had. So then we uh, uh, got into the, uh, the, the Oasis Village, which was, um, it was kind of a, a really, I, I can't, I'm trying to think what the locals would have thought of us <laughs> showing up and running through. And we were, I, I was leading uh, Ron Hackett through this um, stage and, uh, there was this boy with a herd of goats. And I, I said, well, oh, Ron, we just have to stop for a minute. And he's like, what? And I'm like, goats. And so we had to wait for the goats to kind of pass. And then the kid was really curious about us. And he wanted to talk to us in English a little bit. And uh, so he asked us to wait a minute. And then he, he ran off and we were waiting for a couple of minutes. And he came back with dates. He had some, some dates that he had just picked. And he, he gave them to us, which was really good. They were, they were, they were really good. They were very, very dry, but they were very good. So this was the, the checkpoint in the village. Now, now some people uh, for this stage decided to stop and actually rest for a little bit. Our plan was always just to push right through. There's no point. I mean, we had run 50 mile races before and we thought we'll just treat this as another 50 mile race, like checkpoint to checkpoint, just push through. Um, the, the nice part of this stage, uh, because there was some greenery, it, it really kind of helped with the monotony because it was such a long day through the desert that uh, it was nice to see scrub and trees and goats and, and whatever. So. Uh, <laughs> this was uh, getting towards sunset and I had probably three songs left of life in my iPod. And so we'd been going for probably 14 hours at this point. So we were very, very, very tired. And we were all starting to get a little punchy. And so I'm listening to Hendrix on my iPod and my teammates in front of me just kept looking back and laughing because I was just having such a blast. Like, you know, what, what could be better? It was just this listening to Voodoo Child, you know, in the desert. It was my Carlos Castaneda kind of moment. It was, it was really quite funny. But then it died and that was it. <laughs> So um, it, as we got towards sunset, we started to get into the, the Black Desert, which was, um, we'd sort of been skirting around it, but then we, we got right into it. You can see why they call it the Black Desert. It was quite, quite amazing. Um, as, as it started to get dark, you know, you'd start getting the, the stars would come out and, and um, you, you couldn't see the flags anymore. So what happened at sunset is that um, the guy in a, in a Jeep would sort of you know, drive by and he'd, he'd open the door while the thing's still going and they'd take glow sticks, those little glow sticks, and they'd hang them off the little pink flags and then just keep going. And so as it got dark, all you would see in the distance were these glow sticks and the stars. And we, read with the, we, we ran with our headlamps for a while, but then we, we turned them off because it was actually, there was enough light with the moon that you could actually see. But it was a bit surreal because you would just see glow sticks and so it was like running down a runway and you'd <laughs> You just see them and then they would end because you couldn't, there was like a sand dune or a hill and you, you couldn't tell. And um, at, once we got, you know, 70 kilometers into the stage, it was kind of like, okay, 
we got we close. We knew there was only one more checkpoint. My one teammate had lost a toenail. My other teammate at this point um, had an infection. A couple of her blisters got infected, and they were really, really, really suffering. But they gutted it out, and the amazing athletes that they are. But we were all so tired. I mean, at one point, I started actually falling asleep while I was running. I was like <laughs> trying to pull myself back. It was quite a bizarre experience. So uh, once it was dark and, and we, we started to see the, the, the glow sticks, you, you'd hear the drums. At the end of each stage, they would have one of those Japanese drums, and somebody would sit there and bang on the drums. Well, the problem was is that they would echo. So you know, again, you'd think you're close, but you still had quite a long ways to go. I'm um, just keep swimming. I was doing a, uh, an ultra last year, and for whatever reason, this popped into my head. I mean, if you have kids, you you know see Finding Nemo how many hundreds of times, um, and it just popped in my head. And so I was running with uh, this this woman, Venetia, and I said, you know, I just had the most bizarre thought, and I told her this, and she said, no, because I've been saying that for about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was quite it was quite funny. Um, that kind of sums up what it was like the last few miles. It was very strange. It was kind of like a bit of a neither world. Like the, the pain was very intense at, at that time. My, my feet were uh, sore than they've ever been in my life. And um, my shoulders were killing me and everything was saying stop. And I remember I was just putting my feet in tracks that were ahead of me and that kind of all I did to kind of focus for those last um, few miles. When we finally got to the end of the stage, it was about midnight, and the race organizers, uh, the course designer was this guy, Carlos, and he was very mean. So what he would do is at the end, he would always hide the, the base camp out of your sight line. So you'd, you knew it was close by, but he would hide it behind a hill or something just to mess your head up. So with this stage, we had to come over three huge dunes. The last dune was really, really steep. And it was like something out of a movie. We were like hands and knees, like crawling up this dune. And then we get to the top, and it's like, there's the finish line. And the people are like, hey! And it's like you're slapping your hand over and then pulling yourself <laughs> up. And it was just, I, they were very mean. So the, the finish line, uh, a couple of people had actually uh, uh, grabbed their sleeping bags and were waiting at the finish line for other people to start coming in. Um, we just passed out. We just went to our tent. I don't even think I inflated my mattress and just like passed out. And so in the morning when we got up, there were runners that were still coming in because people had 36 hours to finish the stage. So by 8 a.m., there were people still coming in. And at 3 p.m., uh, no, it was just about 5 to 3, which was 3, 3 p.m. was the cutoff. The last runner came in. And what was great is that everybody in the camp got up, dragged them, limped to the, to the finish line to, to cheer her in. And it was, a, it was a, again, one of the amazing things of, of just the sense of community at the race. So we, we had to stay a whole other day um, until we would get transport back to Cairo to the finish line. But... I, not being that bright, I didn't think that stage five, I, I in my head saw stage five as one day, but apparently math, I'm not very good at it, 36 hours, it's more than one day. <laughs> Plus we stayed a whole, so it was really two days for stage five. I had no more food, I had nothing. So, uh, you know, I tried the puppy eyes and, you know, begged and, and thankfully my, my tent mates had some, some extra and I scrounged and, you know, tried to get by on one bar for eight hours, and I, I survived. It was, I was hungry, so what, anyways. But, um, so uh, the, the next morning we, we woke up uh, about six, and the four by fours um, were waiting to drive us, I think it was about 10 or 15 K to the highway where the buses would take us back to Cairo for stage six. Um, this was a blast. I mean, these were these like 20, 30 year old land cruisers, no seat belts, back seats ripped out and you know, like benches put in. And these guys were flying over the dunes. I mean, it was a blast, but I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've just run through the desert and I'm gonna die in a car crash in the desert. <laughs> so 
it was it was actually it was quite a thrill. It was a lot of fun, but all of us were hanging on to whatever we could hang on to, and it was, it was a lot of fun. So we finally got to the highway, and we're standing out there by this remote highway, waiting for a bus. And and you'd see people occasionally a truck or something would drive by, and they'd look out the window like, "What are you? What are you doing here? How did you even get here?" So it was it was quite funny sometimes. Those was the finish line. The the finish line was really a photo finish. They they Bust us to Cairo, six hours to, to um, the pyramids at Giza. Then they drop us off in kind of a parking air, corralling area. And then they, we had to wait there for like 45 minutes while they set up, you know, the photographers and all that stuff. And we were exhausted by this point. We, you know, we'd, we'd been in a bus, we were all hungry, we were really smelly. It's, nobody was really excited to have to do 2K for the photo finish, but it was amazing um, to do it. They had uh, quite an elaborate setup at the finish line, had camels and a band and the whole thing. And, and the best part of the finish line was cold beer <laughs> and very, very bad pizza. Like the worst pizza I've ever had. But I think I ate six slices of it because I was so hungry. And I, I think I had a few beer as well. Pretty sure, I don't remember. Um, so it, it was uh, certainly, quite picturesque from a distance, though if you've ever been to the pyramids, um, they're, it's sad how dirty and um, ill-kept they are. On, on the side of one of the smaller pyramids, there was actually a garbage dump of bottles and plastic that was, was quite sad in, in many ways. Uh, so with 10 mates, just before we, we left for the, the last little sprint, um, I hope to keep in touch with all of them. They were uh, amazing people. In fact, Daniel and I uh, were already planning something else for the future, so we'll, we'll see. Um, some of the things, you know, it's interesting, I had a couple of um, radio interviews when I came back and, and people were trying to get, like, so, okay, put it into kind of words, right? And it, it's very hard to sort of put it into like a one pithy little sentence, like it was this, or, and I mean, I think the thing that I, why I had done the race is that, it, besides it being a physical challenge, it was, it was mental more than anything else. Um, Ray Zaheb, who's a famous Canadian ultra runner, he, he ran across the whole Sahara, like 3,000 miles. He did the whole thing. So he's a whole other level. He, um, he has a great line. He said, you know, ultra running is 90% mental and the last 10% is mental. And that was kind of a big thing that I'd taken from this. It's that from, from day one, I never doubted myself along the way. Uh, no matter how painful it was, I just embraced the pain. No matter how tired I was, I just embraced being tired. And I think that was such an empowering experience to have gone through that and to um, know that all of us are capable of way more than we think. It's not, I'm not an elite athlete, like I'm not, you know? Um, and compared to, you know, even some of the guys that were there who were like just incredible athletes. But there were people like the most amazing people like Ron Hackett, you know, here's a guy who's blind who runs 250K across the Sahara. People who were, you know, at the back of the pack, the last ones in every day. I mean, those people, I mean, that is amazing. Like they gutted it out every day and did it. And so that was um, kind of the most amazing thing that, that really came through this. There was a, it was a very, uh, empowering experience and um, kind of addictive. I mean, I was addicted to ultra running before, and and now it's like, okay, how what, how do I push it further? How do I push it further? Because it's you know, how do you push it further, and and how much further can you push your mind, not really the body? So, um, the team we got into this before because one of my teammates, Mark, his uh, his granddaughter actually has cystic fibrosis, and um, him and I at one point training for a race said, well isn't there a way we can use running for like good instead of just, you know, what's your finishing time? And so that was when this whole idea started that why don't we try doing this for, for charity? And to our surprise, we raised, you know, over 9,000 for variety and it's amazing. And we want to keep it going. Um, we've uh, decided we want to trail winders as, as an idea to kind of move forward and to keep using adventures as a way to raise money for you know, charities, but also to inspire people to think that it is kind of possible to do this stuff. It's not 
there's nothing special, you know? I, I, I came up with a training plan, I stuck to it. I just said I could do it because I was dumb enough to think I could. And, um, so we've actually, uh, I got to know Ray Zahab just before. Um, I thought, well, I'll send him an email and see if he responds, and I had a question. And to my surprise, he said, he sent me an email and said, give me a call, dude. And so I, I, I called him and we had a really great chat. And uh, he, during the race, uh, kept track and kept sending emails of encouragement. And, and uh, so he decided, he has an organization called Impossible to Possible, and so he's made our team ambassadors of his program. And so we're gonna look at partnering up so we can continue to kind of use adventures as you know, sort of a way to, to do good. He's, he's about to um, leave for Siberia, where he's gonna run 600 kilometers across a frozen lake. So he's a whole other level of crazy. <laughs> Um, so, no, I'm not resting. A lot of people have asked um, if I'm just going to, you know, hang up the shoes, and it's like, no, no, in two weeks I have to start training for the Los Angeles Marathon. And I just, I just want to keep going as long as I can. I mean, there, there was one runner there who was 74 years old, um, Jack Dennis from the UK, who, he's done Badwater, which is a 135-mile ultramarathon through Death Valley in the summer, and he's done it 13 times. So he didn't start running until he was in his 50s. And so um, it, it's, it's possible. You just got to keep doing it. So thanks very much.